Okay, good morning. This is the um, class about crystal nucleation in oxide glass forming liquids. Before I start the class, I promise to show the final stage of the experiment on liquid liquid phase separation. We had predicted that only one droplet would form in this perfume here. But to my surprise, we have two droplets. So we have here two droplets, much, much, much less than thousands of tiny droplets that we had last class. But instead of one, we have two. Now, if I put them into contact, then now we have only one. This is one droplet, as you can see here. One large droplet of one liquid phase dispersed in the other liquid phase. We can repeat this, this experiment here. So I'm going to shake the sample again. So the large droplet was broken down into many, many, many tiny droplets. And let's see by the end of the class if we have one. OK. Um, crystallization is very, very, very important um, in relation to glass science and glass technology. If you look at the main keywords, in the whole history of glass science, if you look at all scientific papers, look for keywords, glass transition, viscosity, diffusion, properties, etc., etc., the most frequent keyword is crystallization, ever. And then, if you sum up with crystal nucleation, crystal growth, this number will be even larger. The number of times that that particular keyword was used. Why is that? Why crystallization is so significant to understand the vitreous state? Well, at least two reasons. One obvious reason is that if you want to make a glass, you have to find some way to avert, to avoid crystallization. This is a main reason from a technological standpoint. People dealing with glasses, they're willing to make glasses. They want to make vitreous materials. So crystallization has to be avoided. And in order to, to um, eliminate or avert crystallization, it's necessary to know the basics of crystal nucleation, crystal growth. On the other hand, if somebody wants to make a glass ceramic, if, if you need or if you are interested in producing a material with crystals dispersed in the interior of a glass sample, you have to be able to induce copious crystallization in the glass volume, in the glass interior. And then, by controlling the size, the size distribution of the crystals, their, their volume fraction, their chemical composition, their texture, uh, the number of different crystal phases, etc., etc., one can then design the properties of the resulting glass ceramic. In some cases, you are interested in developing a transparent, transparent glass ceramic. So the crystal size has to be extremely small, below 
the wavelength of visible light you know, below 300 nanometers or something like that. In other cases, uh, you want to produce a material that is resistant to creep, plastic deformation at high temperatures, so you want a large grain size. Or a material of very high chemical durability, again, a large grain size. So the microstructure, the final microstructure of your material depends on how well you control the nucleation crystal growth processes. So today, we are going to take a look at the theory, uh, or the main theory controlling, uh, governing uh, crystallization uh, nucleation processes. And also, we are going to test this theory to see how well it can predict nucleation rates in glass-forming liquids, especially in glass-forming liquids. The theory is the same for glass-forming, for non-glass-forming, for metallic glasses, for organic glasses, for oxide glasses. It's the same theory, but we are going to give examples here of oxide glass-forming uh, compositions. So I'll be dealing with crystal nucleation mostly with homogeneous nucleation rather than heterogeneous nucleation, although I'm going also to mention a little bit the principles of heterogeneous nucleation. So let's start. Again, I will make use of this famous plot of some property versus temperature. We have a liquid and then a supercooled liquid. At some stage, the relaxation time of the liquid becomes too long, so it's frozen as a glass. We can then heat treat this glass and wait for some time until it crystallizes. So this is the type of process that we are going to see today. What happens to a glass when we heat them up uh, and wait for some time. This heating treatment can be above the Tg or below Tg. There is a myth that glasses do not crystallize below Tg, but they do. They actually do. It's exactly the same process below Tg. A given glass will first relax to the supercooled liquid state and then also crystallize, but it takes time. So most measurements are performed above Tg, but you can also do below Tg. We have um, done some studies here in this lab by heat treating glasses at 50 degrees Celsius, it's a lot, 50 degrees Celsius below the Tg, and waited for a few months and they crystallize. But we prefer to work here, where the nucleation kinetics can be measured in a matter of from seconds to hours. That's the typical laboratory time scales that we use here in the lab and most people use. So this is a micrograph of the so-called drosophila of glass crystallization studies. Lithium disilicate is a very, very good model system to work with uh, nucleation crystal growth kinetics because it's not extremely fast and also not extremely slow. So it has, you know, the right time scales for measurement in laboratory time scales. So there are a lot of studies on lithium disilicate, but also other systems such as barium disilicate, calcium metasilicate, the 1, 2, 3 soda lime silica glass, 2, 1, 3 soda lime silica, lithium diborate, anortite, and a few others. A few systems, they show homogeneous nucleation in the bulk 
even without adding nucleating agents. You know, I should say that to produce a commercial glass ceramic, most commercial glass ceramics, uh, they are produced by adding the so-called nucleating agents, certain oxides or noble metals that induce internal nucleation. But there are a few systems which spontaneously show internal nucleation without, even without nucleating agents. And the community uses these kind of systems, such as lithium disilicate, uh, to understand the process. They are model systems to understand the nucleation process, also the crystal growth process. Okay, I have mentioned before about the keywords. I had forgotten that I had this slide, but I, I see that I have it now. So, if you see, in the history of glass research, in the past 200 years, crystallization is the most used keyword, followed by glass transition, then composition, thermodynamic properties, activation energy, structure, phase transition, then nucleation, diffusion, sintering, blah, 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 phase separation that we have seen in the previous class, and crystal growth and glass forming ability. So summing up, all these star market keywords refer to crystallization. Very, very important. And along this, the several classes, I think you have already heard most of these keywords. Most of these keywords, they are the, the main core of glass science. And we, we, we have covered part, and we'll cover most of these keywords until the end of this course here. Okay, so uh, the objectives today is to summarize the classical nucleation theory. There, there are other theories, but this is the most used theory to understand and describe a nucleation kinetics. And then we are going to test it, how well this theory can predict or describe nucleation rates in glass forming materials. Before we move on to explain the theory, it's important to give an idea to those who are not familiar with this type of um, topic on how, how you can measure nucleation growth rates, overall crystallization rates. Normally, it's a very time-consuming, very delicate uh, kind of experiments. If you are interested in measuring nucleation in the sample volume, then somehow you have to use a microscope to count the number of crystals which appear in the volume of your sample. If the crystals are very small, one has to use electron microscopies, either scanning or transmission electron microscopies. If they are large enough, above one micron or so, one can also use optical micro microscopes. And then the idea is to vary the time at a certain temperature, and then count the evolution of the number as a function of time. And in doing this, of course, if you work at a very, very low temperatures, it will take a huge amount of time. At very high temperatures, the process is too fast. There is a certain range where the kinetics is measurable, and this range is around Tg. For most glass-forming materials, uh, we are able to measure the nucleation kinetics in a range around 50, 60 degrees Celsius, or around Tg. That's for oxide glasses, oxide glass forming. 
materials. And then you normally have an induction time, and after the induction period, or known steady state period, the nucleation rates, which are given by the slope of these curves, reach steady state conditions. So an induction time and the steady state nucleation rate. This is for a fixed temperature. If you then vary the temperature, you can have these plots in different temperatures. And by calculating the derivative, one can then have the nucleation rate curve versus temperature. And the same sample can be used to estimate the growth rates. If one measures normally the size of the largest crystal, because the largest crystal was the one that nucleated first. So if you, if you are able to follow the size, there's always a size distribution of the largest crystal versus time, you have a growth rate. Actually, you can measure the size of any crystal, but it's tougher to follow the one and the same crystal in different samples, you know, heat treated for different times. So the easiest, the easiest way is to get the size of the largest. And this is the growth rate. And then you, again, you vary the temperature and get the growth rate at the different temperature and so on until uh, you reach a point where the growth rate is so fast that it can no longer be measured. And the combination of this nucleation growth gives what's known as the overall volume fraction crystallized. This is the shape, the S-shaped volume fraction crystallized. And the interesting feature of these three curves is that um, there is a very strong theoretical model that we are going to see in the future, the so-called Johnson, Melov, Rami, Komogorov model to describe the overall, the overall crystallization um, rate at a, diff, at a certain temperature. So if you have this curve and this one, you can estimate this one. Or if you have this one and this one, you can estimate this one. Or if you have this and this, you can calculate this one. So they're, they are interconnected. You need two of these uh, kinetic curves to calculate the third. In the very best experiments, you can determine this, this, and this, and then calculate back, you know, from this and this, you can also have a theoretical curve here and compare if your theoretically calculated curve agrees or not with the experimentally determined curve. So this is a way to do a consistency test. Consistency test. And uh, the three final exercises I'm going to give you for your homework will be to get nucleation rate data, then test the theory for your adopted glass, then you're going to get crystal growth rate data for your adopted glass, test the theoretical models, and then with nucleation rate, growth rate, you're able to calculate the overall volume fraction crystallized and from the volume fraction crystallized estimate the so-called critical cooling rate for glass formation. In other words, how fast you can you have to cool down a glass forming liquid to avoid crystallization or to make a glass, to vitrify that liquid. 
So the three final exercises, you know, and you have about six weeks to do this, is to get information about nucleation and growth rate data for your glass. So you can start digging of the literature to find this data. And uh, later on, I'm going to give you more details about this. Anyway, there are a number of techniques, experimental techniques that are used uh, to gather information, optical microscopy, electron microscopy, um, X-ray diffraction, Raman spectroscopy, DSC, NMR. Uh, viscosity measurements are needed to calculate these curves. Diffusivity, CP, density. You can, for instance, get this curve by measuring the density of the glass and of the partially crystalline materials and the density of a fully crystalline material. By measuring density, you can you are able to uh, find this kind of volume fraction crystallized. So there are many, many techniques. Okay, in the end, in the end, by varying the temperature, you finally come up with a curve like this, nucleation rate, given by the number of nuclei, of critical nuclei, which form by per cubic meter per second. This is the nucleation rate for lithium disilicate, and it almost coincides with Tg. If you look at the Tg of this glass, is about um, 455 degrees Celsius, and the maximum nucleation rate is 455 or 450 or so degrees Celsius. For most systems, which show homogeneous nucleation, for heterogeneous nucleation, if you add P205, it's a good nucleating agent for this particular glass, or platinum particles or silver particles, these are known nucleating agents for lithium disilicate, then the curve is shifted to much higher temperatures. These curves are shifted to higher temperatures. So the fact that we are, this is the melting point. We are well below, well below the melting point. This is called the undercooling or supercooling. These are deeply super cool liquids. Deeply super cool liquids. This is the a measure of the thermodynamic driving force to induce nucleation. That's why we believe that we are actually measuring homogeneous nucleation. First sign is that the supercooling is very, very, very high. You know, from here to here, you have about 700 degrees Celsius, almost, of supercooling. The driving force, of course, increases and increases and increases with the supercooling. This supercooling liquid wants to crystallize. It's far away from its equilibrium. It wants to crystallize, and then you have homogeneous nucleation. The crystal growth rate curves, they peak, normally peak at much higher temperatures. For oxide glass formers, this peak here is normally occurs or is measurable at about 0.95 of the melting point. If you take everything in Kelvin, this is where the maximum Umax growth rate is normally uh, observed. So this is for Umax. For Imax, the maximum nucleation rate is about 0.5 to 0.6 of the melting point. Much deeper, much deeper 
undercoolings for homogeneous nucleation. Let me stress this fact here that for homogeneous nucleation, for heterogeneous nucleation, any, any undercooling will be enough for heterogeneous nucleation. Um, of course, to you know, each data point shown here refers to one temperature. So it's a lot of work to get to get the full curve here and the full curve here demands a lot of work, a lot, a lot of time, a lot of careful work. But some people have done, and there is enough data already in the literature for some systems. We are going to re review all the data. And again, uh, it's somewhat deceiving. It, you see here this white, uh, this blue dots here. There are many, so they're, they're centered together, but there are these blue dots here refer to crystal growth rate curves. It's not zero. And this is very deceiving because this, this is a linear scale. You see one, two, three, four, five. This is a linear scale. In a linear scale, it seems that the growth rate is zero here and the nucleation rate seems to be zero here. But if you plot this in a logarithmic scale, you see that they merge. In logarithmic scale, uh, these two curves, they overlap. And they're never zero. They're only zero at the melting point. So if, if we have a melting point here, and if we plot now in log scale, the growth rate will come here and will never, never be zero, and the nucleation rate will uh, peak somehow here and be here. So they're, they're never zero. So don't be deceived by some papers or books when you see linear scale versus logarithm scale. This is the real picture. Nucleation growth always overlap. Of course, the values, the actual values of nucleation rate are very small here, uh, of growth rate is very small here and large here, whereas the values, the magnitudes of the nucleation rates are very high here and very small here. But this is the real picture, log scale. So my suggestion to you is always try to use log scale when you're dealing with this type of kinetic phenomena, nucleation, crystal growth, diffusion, viscosity, all these kinetic phenomena uh, need to be seen in log scale because they vary a lot with small variations in temperature. They are very sensitive to temperature. Professor, I have a problem with the term undercooling. It is true for the melting, but for the melting, the melting want to crystallize. But for the glass, we heat it up. We cannot use under, we should say overheating. You know, because when you say heating, you have the crystallization. Yeah, no, yeah, the term, the term, the term is always under cooling. The term, yes, the term is always under cooling. The meaning of this term is that how far below the melting point you are. It doesn't matter if you come this way or this way. If I'm here, the under cooling is this difference here, is how far you are from the melting point. The path... How far you are from, for example, TD in 
Yeah, yeah but yeah. it doesn't matter. The, the, the term, the meaning of this term is how far you are from the melting point. And the driving force is that amount of... The, di the driving force is proportional. I'm going to, it's proportional to delta T. It's proportional. We are going to see the full expression. It's proportional. The higher the delta T in general, the higher the driving force. But the CP has to take into account. I, I'm going to give you the full expression. But the point I like to make now, this is just a, a macroscopic overview of nucleation, you know, the phenomenology, is that do not confuse a linear scale. It's not wrong. This is also correct. But it gives an erroneous idea that gross rates are zero here and that nucleation rates are zero here. No, uh, this is the true picture. They're, not, they're only zero. They're only zero at the melting point and above. You know, above the melting point, the equilibrium, the thermodynamically equilibrium phase is the liquid. There is no nucleation growth in the liquid. Nucleation growth only takes place in undercooled or supercooled liquid. The two terms are used, undercooled or supercooled. It depends on the author. Okay? Right. Ah, and then uh, this, we think it's homogeneous nucleation. You know, um, I have some arguments to try to convince you that we are dealing with homogeneous nucleation. Because every time I give a seminar about crystal nucleation in glasses to a non-expert um, community, they ask, well, how do you know that this is homogeneous nucleation? Because homogeneous nucleation is not thermodynamically favorable. Heterogeneous nucleation on bubbles, on scratches, or impurity particles is much more favorable. So people ask, why? How can you be sure that you are dealing with homogeneous nucleation? I'm going to give you some arguments along the class. The first one is that the supercooling or undercooling is huge. So we have enough driving force for homogeneous nucleation. This is the first argument. But there are others. Any questions about this part? This is just the phenomenology. Of course, nucleation is also important for uh, many other type of types of materials. In solidification of metals, for instance, solidification of metals, a key step is, is, is nucleation. I'm, I'm talking about crystalline, you know, crystalline metals. For metallic glass formation, you have to avoid nucleation. For um, uh, raindrops to form, that's a nucleation process from, from water vapor. So nucleation is one of the key, most important phenomena uh, in our lives. Oops. Yes. This is a very interesting plot. And the second argument to convince you that we are dealing with homogeneous nucleation. Here in this plot, we combined nucleation rate data from different authors. So glasses made in Germany, in Russia, in Russia again, in Japan, in the UK, in Russia, in Korea, Japan, in India, in the UK, in Russia, in the USA, in Brazil, in China. You know, all these people have made lithium silicate glasses using different chemicals, using different purities, you know, the air, the surrounding air, of course, it's different in every one of these labs. You have different solid particles, different amounts of humidity, and so on. 
And it's amazing to see how well this nucleation rate data agree. Of course, this is now logarithmic scale, you know, steady state nucleation rates, 10 to the power 6, the power 7, 8, 9, 10. It's logarithmic scale. So, of course, there is some scatter. There is some scatter due to all these problems that I have mentioned. And uh, another difficult problem is that, okay, one wants to do or to produce a stoichiometric lithium disilicate, exactly lithium disilicate, it's almost impossible. There's some laws of lithium, there are impurities in the chemical, so you are either to one side or to the other side, let's say 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3 percent to one side of the composition or lithium rich or lithium poor composition. So, None of these glasses are exactly lithium disilicate. They are more or less lithium disilicate. And they have different degrees of impurities. Also, there are errors in the actual measurements. It's all embedded in these curves. But they agree. The maximum is here. This is about TG of these glasses. It's a TG. TG is here of these glasses, more or less. See? They agree. If we are dealing with heterogeneous nucleation, then for one glass, we would have you know, this curve here, and for another glass would be here. Because I'm going to show the theory to you. The position of the maximum is very sensitive to the surface energy, to the nucleus liquid surface energy. In heterogeneous nucleation, the surface energy changes. It changes the magnitude and the position. But this is amazing. All of them have a maximum at about 450 degrees Celsius or so, 725 Kelvin. This is another strong, very strong indication of homogeneous nucleation. Very nice. Okay. Another strong evidence is this is the probably the very best um, overall study of nucleation growth in one material was carried out by Dr. Hoffman in the 70s and 80s with polyethylene. It's a polymer. Polyethylene, uh, it's, a, it's a good glass forming material, but also crystallizes uh, in laboratory time scales. So in the combination of different works, they're able to calculate the liquid crystal surface energy, this is millijoules per square meter, by a thermodynamic method, and yielded a value of about 90. And then from crystal growth kinetics, from 88 to 95, from pure nucleation kinetics, 89 to 92, and from a combination of nucleation growth, 89. You see that the surface energies are very, agree quite well by different methods. I'm going to explain how you can estimate the surface energy, but they agree. And, and if, if the surface energies were different, the peak position would change a lot. The peak position is very, very sensitive to the surface energy. So this is another uh, s another set of experiments which vindicate the assumption of homogeneous nucleation taking place in some glass forming systems. In metallic glasses, it's more difficult because metallic glasses do not normally dissolve oxide impurities. So if you have the oxide impurities in the air, it's clay particles, silica, dust, and 
all sorts of, if they, if they dip, if you are melting a metallic glass and this oxide dip inside, they will stay there and can act as um, heterogeneous nucleation sites. In oxide glass making, we are lucky because any of these particles which are coming from the air, they're dissolved, they're melted, they dissolve. They're no longer oxides. They're ionic species which are dissolved in that sea of oxygen. You know, so oxide glass forming, glass forming liquids are good model systems because they also dissolve impurities. The only type of impurity that's not dissolved is um, noble metals such as platinum or silver or gold. You know, you can have a few metallic particles coming from the platinum crucible, for instance. But these are very few normally. You can spot them with an electron microscope. You can visualize these metallic particles. They are much, much, much less than the number of crystals which actually form. I'm talking about, you know, 10 to the power 10 crystals. You see here, see, this is 10 to the power 10 crystals per second per cubic meter. If I have a cubic meter of glass, every second I'm forming 10 billion crystals in this glass. And the number of particles, platinum particles, would be like 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 particles. It's, it's much less coming from a crucible, I'm saying. Anyway, this is the phenomenology. So that was a rather long introduction that I gave because I know that some people in this class are not familiar with a nucleation or crystallization phenomena. Let's now take a look at the theory. classical nucleation theory, then I'm going to show experimental tests for homogeneous nucleation, which have been carried out by different groups in the past 70 years or so. And then uh, it does not always explain the experimental rates, so we are going to discuss some possibilities uh, to account for this failure of the theory to explain the nucleation rates, and finally some open scientific issues that warrant uh, further research in this area. Yes? The difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation is the homogeneous starts in the middle of the glass and the heterogeneous starts in a bubble or something like that. Yes, uh, good question. I, I should have said that. Homogeneous nucleation takes place with equal probability in any volume element of the glass sample or of the liquid. I should say liquid because we use the term nucleation in glass, but we normally actually are doing nucleation in the supercooled liquid. But to avoid saying supercool liquid every time. We mix these two words, you know. But, you know, the probability of forming a homogeneous, uh, a nucleus by homogeneous nucleation is the same in any tiny volume element of the liquid. Whereas heterogeneous nucleation only forms in cert certain special places, such as in a bubble surface, or a solid particle which is embedded in the liquid or some external surface. Okay? Right. So let's take a look at the theory now. Uh, the distinguished gentlemen in this picture are like the fathers of nucleation theory. You know, Gibbs, this is Gibbs, Taman. Taman was the first to draw, experimentally determine, a curve like this one. This is called the Taman curve. 
because he was the first to uh, measure this curve for an organic liquid many, many, many years, almost a century ago, uh, Taman. Taman was actually Russian. Many people think he was a German scientist, but he was a Russian scientist. And then former Kashyev and uh, David Turnbull and many others, but these are very important figures. I'm just listing their names here because you, you see these names when you're going to review and study the, the early stages of the uh, nucleation theory. Okay, so um, um, we have already explained that homogeneous nucleation takes place in any volume element, whereas heterogeneous nucleation forms preferentially on a foreign surface. Solid impurities, crucible walls, bubble seeds, etc., etc. This is the main difference. Of course, this is much more common in daily life but very difficult to study because, first of all, you have to detect the nature of impurities in the foreign surface. They are all around, and it's, of course, very important, very uh, relevant, but uh, from an from a, a educative point of view, I'm placing uh, emphasis on homogeneous nucleation because the bases are the same. The bases are the same, it's easier to explain, to give data uh, on homogeneous nucleation. Although I must say I have worked a lot on surface and heterogeneous nucleation, and if you are interested, I can give you papers, several papers on heterogeneous nucleation. So we will not dwell with heterogeneous nucleation in this class. <clears throat> okay, the basics of nucleation are very interesting and easy to follow. If we have the free energy in this axis here, in the radius of a particle in this axis here, so you can imagine that you have a supercool liquid, very homogeneous, no liquid liquid phase separation, nothing. It's a very uniform, homo chemically homogeneous liquid. And this, of course, the liquid is heated, say above TG, and the, the particles are moving and, and vibrating and they have some freedom. So there is a probability that you know, fluctuations of a certain size form. So fluctuations form and their structure is similar to the structure of the crystalline phase. When they do that, a free energy term, which is positive, appears. We had no free energy, no surface. This is a surface free energy. We have a new surface form, so there is this positive term. This also is strain energy, because when a um, cluster forms, if it has a structure similar to the structure of the final crystalline phase, the density, the mass density, will be different from the density of the liquid. So there is some strain energy, which again is positive. So this is positive, this is positive. On the other hand, there is a negative contribution. The volume-free energy of a crystal-like phase is always less than the free energy of a liquid, because this is a super cool liquid. We are below, below the melting point. So the stable phase is the crystal phase. Okay, so we have two positive terms, one negative term. In the sum, we will give 
the resulting curve. This is the most important resulting curve. If the fluctuation is smaller than a certain critical size, it will dissolve back to minimize the energy. We have a gain in energy here. To minimize it, it will dissolve back. If they are larger than a certain critical size, they will grow because then they will minimize the overall free energy by growing. This is at a certain fixed temperature. This is at fixed temperature. If I change the temperature, the critical size will increase. This is for a particular temperature. This gives the overall, the overall uh, uh, picture of this fight between all these three types of energies. Two positive energies, one negative. In the delta G star, this is the work of formation of a critical nucleus, is this a delta G star, which is always or also known as W star. So delta G star or W star, W comes from work, thermodynamic work, is the barrier the thermodynamic barrier that has to be overcome for the nucleation process. So the nucleation is not a spontaneous process. It has to overcome a certain barrier. And this depends on the temperature. This is for a fixed temperature. For different temperatures, we have different barriers. Delta G star. Only after overcoming this delta G star, is that the fluctuations can grow. So they nucleate and grow. Only those who are larger than this size here are, are named critical nuclei. Those before or smaller are named embryos. So embryos form and dissolve, form and dissolve. When they overcome this barrier, then they are called nuclei, because then they grow. Um, I, 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 I had a class about this when I was doing my undergrad course here. I had a very good professor teaching on solidification of metals. This is the first time I, I heard about this plot. It was many, many years ago. And this guy was very enthusiastic. He was uh, Professor Mauricio Pratis, he was an expert on solidification of metals. And I'm using the same plot that uh, he showed to us 30, 40 something years ago, more than 40 years ago, 1976. Um, so, if we are going to calculate then this work, this W, the work to form a fluctuation of size R. Let's assume that this is spherical. Just to calculate, we can assume they are spherical, and then is the radius to the third power times delta GV, this one is the delta GV. I'm using these two bars here because this is a negative, this is a negative quantity. So let's use in modulus here, delta GV minus delta G strain plus um, a geometrical factor, surface energy to uh, the square root of the radius. Let's do it. Let's do an exercise here. Let's assume spherical, spherical particles, spherical particles, 
you know, these embryos are spherical. Let's, uh, to make things easier, assume that the strain energy can be neglected. And why we can assume that? Because we are not doing nucleation in solid state. If you have a, a deformed metal, you are hitting this metal for recrystallization, then it's solid, solid. But here, it's solid forming in a glass, in a liquid, in a liquid. So if the solid cluster forms in a liquid, the liquid can relax. We are above Tg. If you remember, the relaxation time above Tg is seconds or so. So at least above Tg, you can assume that these crystals form and the liquid relax. They form and the liquid relax. Later on, I'm going to test if this is a good strategy or not. But most people neglect the delta G strain. So we can write for solid particles that W R is um, 4 pi <coughs> over 3 R cubed. This is the volume of the cluster, if, if the cluster is spherical. Delta GV in modulus plus um, plus uh, uh, 4 pi r square sigma and then we can take this modulus here and put a negative sign here so now we have Now we have <coughs> the expression for the work of formation of a cluster of size R. Looking at this curve here, we are interested in calculating the maximum value. So the maximum value takes place when the derivative is zero. That's the maximum of that function. So I'll give you two minutes or three minutes to calculate. I want to calculate here the size of the critical nucleus and the value of W star. I want to calculate this RC and delta G star. Let me call, use the same notation, the size of the critical nucleus from this expression. Please uh, try to exercise yourselves for a minute or so. The critical radius should be 2 times sigma 0 divided by delta GV. Now, if you insert this value into here again, you find W star. In W star, it will be 16 pi over 3 sigma 0 to the third power to delta GV to the second power, right? This is the value of the work that the critical nuclei have to overcome before they are considered critical nuclei. Of course, this is neglecting, neglecting the 
strain energy term. We can also include the strain energy term here. If we include the strain energy term here, then this will be minus delta G strain energy to the second power. Later on, I'm going to show you what's the effect of including the strain energy. But for the time being, I'm going to neglect it because it seems to be a reasonable assumption. Seems to be a reasonable assumption. You're forming a crystal in a liquid, the liquid relax, and so the strain energy relax. In doing this assumption, we are also assuming that the relaxation, relaxation of the liquid is faster than the induction time of nucleation. If you recall, in one of the first slides, I have shown that nucleation does not start immediately. It normally takes some time before nucleation reaches some steady state. So when we neglect delta GS, we are assuming that the relaxation time is much shorter than the induction time. Like the relaxation time is only here or so. So the liquid relax and does not affect nucleation. But we are going to check this later on, this assumption. Okay, did you all, have you, did you all follow this? <coughs> this is just a simple derivative. <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then we calculate the critical nucleus size and then we insert the value here and here and calculate the value of W star, which in the figure is called delta G star, but I left this on purpose because in certain papers they call delta G star, in other papers they call it W star, so it's the same. Even other authors also call WC or delta G C. Let me write this down here. They also call delta G C of critical nucleus or W C of critical nucleus. There are many notations for this very important quantity. I like very much this, as I said, this picture because it shows, it shows the basics of the nucleation phenomenon. Although you might say, well, this is very theoretical. You know, I don't believe that actually you have a liquid, you heat a, the liquid, certain fluctuations form and dissolve, form and dissolve, form and dissolve. Only those which are larger than a certain critical size will be able to grow. This seems to be some, well, nice, but how can we prove this experimentally? And these ideas were, came up from Gibbs more than 100 years ago. He did not have electron microscopes to check or any or molecular dynamics or any of these sophisticated techniques to check these ideas. And, and I also wondered about this for several years, you know, um, until I found this very interesting, very interesting result from molecular dynamics in, um, let me see, 2000, 2000, 17 years ago, Porting Taftu, they created 
a material in a computer, you know, this com molecular dynamic simulations, you can create a material in the computer, and they took germanium, pure germanium, just a semi semiconductor, at half of the melting point. This was very clever because half of the melting point is where the maximum nucleation rate is normally observed. The maximum homogeneous nucleation rate. So they supercooled germanium. This is a computer, a computer glass, a computer material, to half of the melting point. And they had a clever idea. They created, I'm not sure you, if you can see here, can you see here, a nano-sized crystal in a vitreous matrix. So this is the liquid, you know, with the ring size distribution and so on, all the features that we have discussed. But they created a nano-size crystal here, and they varied the size. They created one with one nanometer, another one with 1.5, two, two and a half, three nanometers. This is the kind of size that you normally get if you calculate a little bit the surface energy delta GV at this kind of undercoolings, the sizes that you get is from one to three nanometers. Nanometers. Calculated for the critical nucleus. So they did that. And then you let the computer run, and they can measure the growth rate of these clusters here. They measure the growth rate, if they increase or if they decrease in size, to test this idea of forming, dissolving, or growing. And the result was fantastic. So the average velocity, average velocity of these clusters, crystalline clusters, versus size, and this is the result. Negative, negative velocity means dissolving. Positive velocity, growing. Zero, the critical nucleus size. The critical nucleus size is two nanometers. But most important is not the value itself, but the concept. See, the computer, this is a computer simulation. They did not insert the theory inside. They just create the material and let the system run for that particular temperature. Smaller than the critical size, dissolve back. Larger, they grow. And reach, this is their growth rate you know, 0.5, half a meter per second, very fast. Half a meter, this per second. Because in the computer, you have to find systems which nucleate and grow very, very fast, because these computer simulations are picosecond type, type, type of times, or femtosecond sometimes, very, very fast. Uh, simulation, so they're looking for low viscosity materials. You know, they cannot yet, I think, do these kind of calculations for a glass which has a viscosity of 10 to the power 12 Pascal second at Tg. This is about the Tg of this, the Tg of the, our glass forming oxides is about half of the melting point. But they use low viscosity liquids, pure iron, pure nickel, uh, sodium fluoride, water, this kind of materials, pure germanium, and were able to show the concept of a critical nucleus. We have people working with us now. Um, trying to repeat these computer experiments 
and to advance these computer experiments in other temperatures to get some other parameters that are very important to understand this process. But this is a key, a key paper, in my opinion, real key paper. This, in my opinion, could easily be a paper for nature, for science, easily. Um, just don't know why they did not submit, or maybe they have submitted uh, their paper to one of these very top journals and it was rejected. I don't know this story, but it's a key paper. Ground-breaking paper, in my opinion. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a first um, proof of the critical radius concept. Any questions about this? Very nice top experiment. This is the kind of experiment that <clears throat> we should look for. Some some experiment or calculations or that leads to breakthroughs, you know, clarifies ideas or brings up new ideas. This is one of them. They also have calculated, you know, the thickness of the interface, you know, this interface between the crystalline material, which is in dark here, and the glassy part or liquid part, which is in white, it, it's diffuse. I mean, it's not like a sharp interface, like here, you know, I have a glass and then air. It's more or less diffuse, and they have even estimated the thickness of the interface, you know, 0.5 nanometers at least. Recall that the nucleus size is about 2 nanometers, but then there is an extra 0.5 due to this roughness. It's not sharp. And this complicates the concept of the surface energy. You know, this surface energy, you assume a sharp interface. You have a crystal and a liquid. Well, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay. So, partial conclusions, proof of the embryo versus nucleus concept, embryos dissolve, critical nuclei grow. The calculated size at Tm over 2, 0.5 of Tm, 2 nanometers, agree with the kind of size that we calculate. And you guys are going to calculate the critical sizes for your glass, you know. I'm going to give you an exercise for next week. You're going to calculate this for your own glass. You see that it's in this kind of neighborhood. And they have also shown that the liquid interface, nucleus liquid interface, is diffuse. Now, I believe you're more convinced of this concept, but if you're not fully convinced, I'm going to try to show you a video. Another material, uh, stichovite, is a form of silica. You know, silica have several allotropic crystal phases. One of very high, and high pressures is stichovite, and high pressures is good because it accelerates the nucleation process. So they could look at the nucleation process in molecular dynamics. This is a video of nucleation of this particular type of silica phase in a silica glass under high pressure. <clears throat> this is the only way to be able to do this in molecular dynamics. So let's see if this video works. <clears throat>
classical nucleation theory expression. The, I'm not going to derive the expression of the classical nucleation re, here, but it suffices to say that the, this is the steady state nucleation rate is some constant times z. This z is not from Zanotto, it's from Zeldovich, a famous a Russian scientist who demonstrated that um, an interesting fact that if you recall the plot of the work of formation versus radius is something like this. Well, he demonstrated that some guys, this is the critical radius. Some uh, clusters, they wonder about here. They wonder here, go forth and back, forth and back, because this is, this is not very sharp. This is shallow. So they wonder about here. In some nuclei that are in this side, they can dissolve back also because this is not very sharp. So this is a factor which was <clears throat> calculated by Zeldovich. And then we have, for homogeneous nucleation, N sub V is the total number of molecules per unit volume of the system. You can calculate this if you know the density of your glass and the molecular weight you can calculate the number in the Avogadro number. You can calculate how many molecules you have per unit volume in your glass. <clears throat> because for a homogeneous nucleation, every site is good enough. If we are dealing with heterogeneous nucleation, this number would be much smaller. This would be the number, say, of catalyzing particles. This is 10 to the power 28 per cubic meter, more or less. 10 to the power 28, more or less, for your oxide glasses. For heterogeneous nucleation, this will be 10 to the power 9, 10 to the power 10, much, much, much smaller. And W star is our famous W star. Is the work necessary, this is W star, to form a critical nucleus. This is the thermodynamic barrier. Nucleation only takes place, only takes place after a group, at, a group of atoms overcome a nucleation barrier. A nucleation barrier. This is a very, very important quantity and mind you that it depends on the cubic power of the surface energy and the second power of the delta G. So it's a very, very, very sensitive quantity which is inside an exponential. Small variations in surface energy will lead to huge variations in nucleation rate because of the exponential factor here. But there is a missing term. And the missing term here in this expression is the diffusivity. Atoms or molecules have to diffuse to form a nucleus. So we have a thermodynamic part of the equation in the transport or diffusion part, and they combined form the expression for nucleation rate, which, by the way, explains why <coughs> there is a maximum. The reason for this maximum here is <coughs> because for 
in lowering the temperature, in lowering the temperature, we increase a delta GV, but decrease the diffusion coefficient. So, increase delta GV, which is good, but decrease the diffusivity. The combination of these quantities lead to a maximum. Orders of magnitude. Z is about 10 to minus 1 or so. This is the order of magnitude of Z. NV is 10 to the power 28 atoms per cubic meter for homogeneous nucleation. And DT, a diffusion coefficient, is normally expressed as a pre-exponential factor and then an exponential of some activation energy for diffusion divided by kT, where k is Boltzmann's constant and T is the actual temperature. So here you have the overall expression for nucleation. What time is it now, please? Half past 11. So I'm going to talk 10 more minutes and then we stop a little bit to discuss your homework. <clears throat> Is all this clear so far? What sort of assumptions are embedded in that expression? We are assuming homogeneous nucleation of the most thermodynamically stable phase. We are assuming that the driving force, the driving force is a delta G. The driving force is the free energy difference between the liquid and the crystal phase, delta G. It can be calculated, it can be measured. But we are assuming I stress free. So, so far, we are neglecting this term here. Okay? <clears throat> and also that it does not depend on the nucleus size. If you recall, the nucleus size is between 1 and 3 nanometers. It's very, very small. We are using values, excuse me, <clears throat> of delta G that are calculated for macroscopic crystals, you know, micro, micron-sized crystals. That's an assumption of the theory. Also that the interfacial energy, sigma, is independent of nucleus size and temperature. Sigma here was considered to be constant. This was considered to be constant. This is a very strong assumption. This is a strong one, constant. And this was assumed, okay, it varies with temperature, as I'm going to show, it varies with temperature, but not with the size of the crystal. These are original assumptions of the theory. In doing that, we come up then replacing the diffusion coefficient by the expression of the diffusion coefficient, something like of the order of xp minus delta gd over kt, xp minus w star over kt. Uh, difficulty is that we normally do not know this quantity here. What's the diffusion, what's the activation energy for diffusion in a silicate glass? 
Is it silicon atoms that are diffusing? Or oxygen? Or lithium, silicon, oxygen, a type of molecule? We don't know. Which of these species is dominating this diffusion process? Okay, if we're dealing with pure germanium, clear enough, is the diffusion of germanium atoms. But if you're dealing with an oxide, three-component oxide, we don't know. What people do, they say, well, okay, this is not clear. So let's assume that viscosity controls the same transport process that's needed to create a critical nucleus, whatever that is, is the same transport process that uh, controls viscous flow. This is not a bad assumption, because there is an equation derived by Einstein, D. Einstein, saying that the viscosity of any liquid is inversely, uh, the diffusion coefficient of any liquid is inversely proportional to the viscosity. So this is the Stokes-Einstein equation. Uh, the beauty of this is that we can embed this equation here. And then there's no need to know exactly a delta GD. It's such, uh, if we believe in this assumption, we measure the viscosity, and then we calculate the transport part. Luckily, you have done that for your adopted glasses. You all have the viscosity as a function of temperature, of course, for your glasses, so you can put that part here. And then for W star, for W star, you already know that it depends on sigma zero delta GV. Delta GV, you can calculate because you have delta CP already. You have the CP data, so it's easy to calculate delta GV. You have the viscosity. The only unknown parameter is sigma zero. But then it's easy to fit. You're going to fit this equation to experimental data that you're going to get from the literature, leaving one unknown parameter, sigma. And then this sigma will come out from your fitting procedure. And that's what people do. Nobody knows for a complex system such as the systems you were working with, the value of this critical nucleus liquid surface energy. This is an unknown parameter, the only unknown parameter of the theory. But we can measure or calculate delta GV, measure or calculate eta. The other are constants, calculable constants. So your next exercise will be, and you have two weeks to do so, to... This is the free energy between a surface. Yes, the surface. You have a surface, there is a free energy between this surface. It's a positive, positive value. But this will come out from the fitting. You don't have this value. It will come out from the fitting of that equation to nucleation rate data. Um, oops. 
So <clears throat> we need viscosity as a function of temperature, steady state nucleation rates. Thus, you are going to get now from the literature. In delta G, as a function of temperature, can be measured. For some systems, there are data. Or you can calculate, and I'm going to give you the equation to calculate that. Those are the quantities or parameters needed to run up a test of the classical nucleation theory. We are going to test if this theory works for different classes. This is just a summary. The viscosity curve for your particular glass, the nucleation rate for your particular glass, and there are measured rates for fresnoite, for barium disilicate, for 2,1,3 soda lime silica, 1,2,3 soda lime silica, lithium silicate with a lot of water, lithium silicate without a lot of water, sodium metasilicate, there are data. You're going to find these data points for your glass, and it varies a lot. If you look here, this is the log of the steady state nucleation rates. Lithium disilicates and sodium metasilicate, the nucleation rate is about a little bit less than 10 to the power 10, the maximum. Whereas for fresnoid, a 10 to the power 17. This is almost like a metallic glass. Metallic glasses have extremely high nucleation rates. So varies a lot from system to system. For barium, this is barium disilicate. The maximum is about 10 to the power 12 or so. Uh, varies a lot. But the interesting feature, look at this axis here. This is the T, the actual temperature, divided by the melting point. All of these glasses, they nucleate here in the range 0.5 to 0.6. You see the maxima, the maxima here is 0 0.51, 0 0.54, 0 0.56, 0 0.54, 0 0.50. They are all, all between 0.5 and 0.6. And I told you this before, very deep undercoolings. That's where the maxima are detected. And that's why, among other reasons, we believe uh, they refer to homogeneous nucleation. Homogeneous nucleation. Now, for delta G, you need delta G. For delta G, uh, there is a simple expression. It's just the heat of melting of your crystal phase divided by the melting point times delta T. I told you this in the very beginning. Delta G is zero at the melting point and then increases, 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 increases as you undercool. The delta G increases. Uh, the glass or the supercooled liquid becomes more and more and more prone to nucleation. There's a large driving force. This is the driving force. There's another expression due to Hoffman. This is John Hoffman, the same who uh, measure nucleation rates in polyethylene. Delta HM over TM squared delta T times T. So this is a lower bound. This is an upper bound. The experimental values are normally in between. <coughs> so um, this is a good test. You are going to calculate the experimental values of your delta G using your delta CP. And as a test, you can also calculate this one and this one, and your values should be in between. This is a consistency test that can be made to make sure that you're doing the right calculations using the right values of the parameters. 
And this is the, the expression. This is, unfortunately, it's not very easy to read. This is somewhat out of focus. Uh, I was preparing this class last night and I did not have time to prepare a better one, but I'm going to explain this to you. You already have delta CP for your glass. That CP of liquid, of the super cool liquid, minus the CP of the crystal phase. You have already this data. So having this, the delta, here is written delta mi. Some people use delta mi, but it's the same. This delta mi, delta mi is our delta g in our notation. So the delta g is the heat of melting, 1 minus T of T melt, minus the integral from the actual temperature to the melting point, delta Cp dt, delta Cp dt, plus, this is the entropy term, this is the enthalpy term, the entropy terms, temperature times the integral of delta Cp over T dt. You have everything to calculate for your glass. You need the melting point, the heat of melting of the crystal phase, and delta Cp. It's a simple integral. This will give the experimental delta G because you are using experimental values of delta Cp, experimental values of delta Hm, and experimental values of Tm. So this should give this expression here that is needed to calculate W. Everything is known except sigma zero, but sigma zero will be an adjustable parameter. Uh, no, it's a little bit curved. That's a, no, no, that's a schematic, but it's curved, slightly curved, slightly curved. We also need to fit in the, we also need to fit in the a curve to use in the problem, or it's not necessary? No, no, you're going to calculate it. You're going to use this expression and calculate it. There's no fitting, nothing. Just calculate. You are going to insert delta Cp here, the melting point here, and delta Hm here. It's just a calculation. To make sure that you're doing this correctly, then you can calculate this upper bound and the lower bound, and your values should be in between. Because if you use some wrong values or something will be here or here, you know that you're not doing it correctly. This is for several glasses. Anyway, what you're going to do is then to linearize, you're going to plot log of steady state nucleation rate versus viscosity over T as a function of 1 over T delta G squared. This is just a linear form of the nucleation rate equation. If everything is correct, this plot should give a straight line. And from the slope of the straight line, you calculate sigma, the unknown parameter. And the intercept will give the value of the experimental pre-exponential. This is the pre-exponential that you can compare with the theoretical value of the pre-exponential. So you get two parameters. From this straight line, you get the intercept in the slope. So in the end, <coughs> let's do it here. you'll be doing
1 over t delta dv square and here the log of nucleation rate times viscosity over t for different temperatures you're varying the temperature you have some experimental data you get a straight line if if the theory works because this is a linear form of the theory and then if you extrapolate the straight line here this will be the log of k1 this parameter here and from the slope from the slope you can calculate sigma zero two parameters any questions this is the last transparency This will be your homework. It seems complicated, but it's very simple. It's just a straight line. You only need nucleation rate data, viscosity, and a delta G. So you need nucleation rate data, viscosity you have. A delta G is easy to calculate because the most difficult part is to get the delta CP, but you have done the delta CP part. And then you plot a few for a combination. At one temperature, you have this and this, you have this data point. Change the temperature, you have this data point. Then you have a straight line. From the straight line, you have the pre-exponential constant and the surface energy. And then you compare this pre-exponential with, with the theoretical value. With the theoretical value. And see if this theory works. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'll be traveling next week. I'll be traveling next week, and uh, you have a test next week, and see you in two weeks. Well, the, the material has not stabilized yet. It's still a little bit hazy, and we have two large droplets formed, but it's still hazy, so there are many droplets in suspension, so we have to continue this experiment some other class, maybe in two weeks. Thank you.